Hello. Welcome. This is The Other People Show. How's it going out there? I'm Brad Listy, and I'm in Los Angeles. It's nice to be with you. I hope everything is going all right, wherever you happen to be. Today is Friday, so it is time for another flashback episode where I dig into The Other People archives and share an outtake from an episode out of the past. We're going to be listening to some of episode 370, my conversation with author Lydia Yuknovich. Episode 370 first aired on July 15th, 2015. Lydia Yuknovich is the best selling author of the novels Thrust, The Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, and Dora, A Head Case. She has also published a story collection called Verge and an acclaimed memoir called The Chronology of Water. I always love talking with Lydia Yuknovich and I'm excited to share an outtake from episode 370. That is coming up momentarily. A quick reminder before we get going that I do a weekly email newsletter. You can subscribe over at bradlisty.substack.com. It's free. The newsletter is simple. I let you know about the latest episodes of the show on a weekly basis, and I also share a list of things that I've been reading and finding interesting. So if that sounds good, head on over to bradlisty.substack.com and sign up for the newsletter. You can also join the Other People Patreon community over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. I would love it if you did that. It's for people who love this show, who listen regularly, who get something from it. Join the Patreon. It's not hard to do. It's a great way to help keep this show going into the future indefinitely. Patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Today's episode is brought to you by Tin House, publisher of the novel Nonfiction by Julie Meyerson. I recently spoke with Julie Meyerson on this show. We had a great talk. You should listen to that episode when you get a chance. Her novel, again, is called Nonfiction, which is a little bit confusing, but it makes sense when you read it. It's called nonfiction, but it's a novel, and it's an excellent novel about addiction and creativity and recovery and family, among other things. It cuts deep. It's a book that stays with you, and it is beautifully and expertly written. Again, it's called nonfiction, available from Tin House, a novel by Julie Meyerson. All right, so today's flashback once again comes from episode 370, which first aired on July 15th, 2015, my conversation with Lydia Yuknovich. A reminder that if you like what you hear in this flashback and you want to go in for the full conversation, just look for episode 370 in the feed, wherever you listen to podcasts. All episodes of The Other People Show are available to listeners. So... Let's get to it. Here I am, in conversation with Lydia Yuknovich back in 2015. That's probably the first one I remember in my lifetime. But then more recently, the green-eyed Afghani girl. Right. And the child who's starving to death, crouched on the ground next to a vulture, um, who's, you know, near death, and the vulture's just sort of waiting. (laughs) Um, And so the question you're asking is the question I wanted to hold open. I don't have some perfect answer, but I do have a deep obsession with the question, you know, what is, do we have any responsibility as the people who make the representations to move in with agency and not just making the representations um, and I have those questions for the photographers. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what I'd do if I was the person. However, I know when my father, who was our abuser in our family, was floating face down in the ocean, 
I could have let him die. And for whatever reason, I couldn't do that. I flipped him over and saved his life. What happened? He lived. No, I know. But what, why was he floating face down in the ocean? He, he never learned to swim. And he was sort of half ass body surfing in the waves and he toppled over face down and drowned and I'd been a lifelong competitive swimmer and I was about maybe 15 yards from him and I busted ass over there and pulled him out and my sister was there too and we gave him mouth to mouth so I've been in the life death moment is part of my point and I can't imagine in your example you gave, I can't imagine leaving a kid there <laughs> right. or, you know, not doing anything, get, not giving them food, not grabbing them and trying to smuggle them away or whatever it was. On the other hand, part of the um, knot I made in the book is that that American benevolent impulse to save has its own complications. Well, I was just going to say, because I, I think I've seen uh, news reports about child prostitutes yes, who in their horrible situations become so brainwashed. I mean, that's the life they know. Right. And there are attempts made, you know, to save these, these children. They don't want to leave. Right. <laughs> and so right. it becomes this kind of like, uh, almost embarrassing situation where you're trying to pull this kid out of this, uh, you know, brothel and the kid is telling you, leave me alone. And, you know, yeah, trying to make sense of that is, is just another puzzle. Right. And in the terms we're talking about, I'd, I'd want to do it anyway. I'd want to just, well, you'll, it'll be okay later. So just, <laughs> yeah, you'll figure <laughs> okay. it out or you're coming with me. But, you know, I tried to complicate that. I don't want to give the whole plot away, but I, I also think there are some blind spots to a the very American savior complex that we don't always think through and we don't always understand cultural differences. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, raise that as a question too. What does it mean? How do you save someone? And how do you treat someone as an equal and not as the object of your saving power? Well, yeah, that, that happens to me in strip clubs, or at least it used to. <laughs> like, you need to go back to school. And these girls are just like, shut up, dude. Just give me your money. <laughs> I'm right with you, though, because, I mean, those are some of the guest speakers I have in my women's studies class. Yeah. And and that's a two-way effort. I'm both trying to educate the students that this is real in life, and it's a choice for particularly women. But I'm also secretly trying to show show the classroom <laughs> to some people in the hopes I can seduce them. I'm right with you, buddy. Yeah, okay. So this <laughs> is this, this brings up interesting questions for me, because um, I think there is such a thing as someone having insight or an ability to help, you know, that another person that seems obvious to me. Yes. Um, it's, I guess it gets trickier when you get into like quote unquote spiritual insight, you know, somebody who might have a, you know, some kind of wisdom that could really help somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then getting into the, into a, uh, an interpersonal situation where you're trying to, uh, transfer that wisdom, share it, you, you know, the person has to be a willing recipient and it can get tricky, you know, no matter how desperately they might need it, no matter how clearly you might see that they need it, sometimes they don't want it. Oh, I think that's true. I think that's our, has to do with our inability to understand the other in front of us and what their subjectivity involves and what their reality involves and how do I learn their language and their world. What we often do is bring our entire matrix upon them and this will probably get me in trouble, but I think the the Christian impulse across the world, you know, to go in and convert and save and proselytize is a is a spiritual impulse gone awry from my point of view, that it's moved into a zone of so canceling out the value system or beliefs or dreams or imagination of the other that it's it's an act of colonization. And if you want to cut that out, you can. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, 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 I think, I, I think I'm right there with you. I, I what's occurring to me and like what I've, you know, been saying to myself in recent years and what I've said on this show before is that, uh, when it comes to that sort of stuff, I'm much more trusting of someone sharing with me an action plan than a belief system. Yes. Like I'd, I'd be much more liable 
to be like Lydia, teach me how to swim because I know you're yes. a big swimmer. Then yeah. to have then to have you some you know somehow teach me uh, you know this belief system you have about what happens to us when we die or you yes. know you know what I'm saying like belief is exactly. belief is tricky but an action plan something to do some sort of practice that could help. Uh, make me manage stress better or feel better or sleep better or all of the above, like that seems more legitimate to me. Right, because the one is ideological and the other is a form of direct action. Yes. <laughs> I don't think everybody agrees with us, though, so we shouldn't feel too sassy. And also, in this book I wrote, the Amer- let's see, I don't want to, the Americans who move into quote-unquote help run into their own problems. <laughs> so they pursue the direct action line. And that, as you suggested earlier, turns out to be a little more complicated when this girl, who they are benevolently moving in to save, you know, has her own will and has her own ideas. Yeah. Well, and yeah. It, like I think, too, about like activism. Yes. Uh, social activism, like people who are working for the cause of peace or something like that. Uh, a lot of times, very angry people. Yeah. And, it's, and, 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 you know, justifiably in some cases. There's injustice out there, and I think a lot of times injustice is what wakes people up to those kinds of causes and gets them involved. Sure. Um, but it becomes problematic, I think, if you're an angry person working for peace. I don't... Can I... Can I... I don't know if I agree with that. Okay. I've, I'm, I'm thinking through it right this second. I remember when... So, you know, we've, there have been recent instances of what's been called rioting uh, here in our country. Sure. Around particularly what's been happening in the black community. And as I've been processing that and trying to listen and learn, uh, nine times out of town, I found myself on the side of the anger and the side of the, you know, rage manifesting to a certain extent. And I kept equating it in my mind to Stonewall because that was something in my lifetime I cared about where people got really angry and said no and stood up. And, you know, that was kind of a riot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's not that I disagree with you. It's that I think it's a little more nuanced in terms of social action. I think there is a space for anger or rage, and it might even be a little necessary it's if it gets stuck there, right? That that worries me more. Do you know what I mean? No, exactly. I was just, like the thing that I was just going to say is sustainability. Like I think it's it's totally natural, especially like in a situation, um, you know, like Ferguson or Baltimore, all right. these all these different instances, Stonewall, whatever it is, you know, where some um, th- there's a lot of injustice. You know, the reacting to injustice with rage, and and if you're being uh, abused, standing up to your abuser, right, and putting your foot down is yes. ex- is acceptable. Yeah, it's uh, a it's a language of a sort, from my point of view. Well, right, and and then I also think of it from a media perspective because, um, you know, the, the news media wasn't covering this stuff nearly as intently, and it wasn't nearly as, um, you know, as uh, visible on social media until people started putting their foot down. You know? Correct, correct. And, and, you know, even in our lifetime, I don't know how old you are. Are you... I'm in... almost 40. Okay. So, wow, I'm really old. <laughs> well, I'm feeling it too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it gets really good after yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You have no idea. I, um, I remember, though, historically, in my own understanding of current events, feeling really strongly, and I, I feel this today, too, that there was no MLK Jr. without Malcolm X. That the two of them were both necessary, in my mind, for peace to emerge, or change, I guess, not peace, but change to emerge. And I, I feel compelled to carry that uh, belief forward that we need the spectrum, you know, the anger and the peaceful march and the prayer. And... And there's a necessary place for all of it in yeah. order for actual change to occur. All right, everybody, there we have it. That was a flashback to episode 370, my conversation with author Lydia Yuknovich. Episode 370 first aired on July 15th, 2015, which incidentally was 
what, six days before my son was born. You can find Lydia on the internet at lydiayuknovich.net. Follow her on Facebook and Instagram. And read her books. Most recently, a novel called Thrust. Don't forget to subscribe to The Other People Show wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the show on Twitter at OtherPPL. On Instagram at OtherPPL.podcast. On TikTok at OtherPPL.podcast. What else? Blue Sky. Check it out. Track it down. I would love it if you subscribed to my newsletter at bradlesty.substack.com. Join the Other People Patreon community over at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Help keep this show going into the future. If you have a couple of minutes, please rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever it is. Rate it, review it. It helps new listeners find the show. If you want to get some other people apparel, a t-shirt or a sweatshirt, head on over to otherppl.com. You can also sign up for the Other People Book Club at otherppl.com. Get a new book delivered to your door every 30 days. I interview book club authors on this show. Last but not least, if you want to read my latest book, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything, available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. Okay, so coming up on Sunday, I will be in conversation with Annie Leontis. She has a new memoir in essays out called Sex with a Brain Injury, available from Scribner. How's that for a title? Sex with a Brain Injury. Get ready for my conversation with Annie Leontis in just a couple of days.